Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Buren, one of two project coordinators for the J. Sherwood McGinnis Junior War, Peace, and Justice Project. Welcome to this evening's symposium event titled Conflict Transformation. The purpose of the symposium is to illuminate the human drama of conflict and war's impact on society, mainly our veterans and their families. We've taken this journey on. We want to share it with the community. Uh, we began about two weeks ago, and we will continue this journey, and all are invited in the community to join us through May of next year. And we hope you can share in, in, in helping us dialogue with the community and addressing those three essential questions. What is war? What is peace? What is justice? And then finally, what is the interrelationship between those three? At this time, I would ask everybody to silence their cell phones. And I'd like to introduce uh, Colonel Bill Flavin, the moderator for this evening's symposium. Welcome, thank you all for being here. Um, we're gonna talk about transforming conflict, transforming conflict at the ground up. I have a little film to show here uh, before we introduce our panelists. Let us show the film, please. Promoting peace in the age of compound risk reflects our global reality. The convergence of overlapping risks is compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many risks, including climate change, environmental degradation, misinformation, radicalization, and terrorism, transcend borders, reinforcing and amplifying one another. One of the things that the pandemic has shown us is that in many ways, in many communities and societies in the world, we are lacking resilience. Promoting peace in the age of compound risk is crucially important and indispensable from economics. This crisis will not end anywhere unless it is over everywhere. We have to take a multidisciplinary approach to understanding the issues and a multi-stakeholder approach to addressing them. Forums like this are extremely important for all of us to come together, have semantic discussions, have technical discussions, but most importantly, have critical discussions. Risk and threats to peace and development are also escalating online and in cyberspace. That's why we at the Forum want to draw attention to digital technologies. But let us also recall that there are digital solutions. Social media platforms can be a positive space for people to connect, forge linkages, and mobilize for human rights, accountability, and peace. But platforms can also drive polarization and extremism, be used to incite violence and hate, and erode the integrity of democracy. What's happened is that everything that we do in the world, whether it's journalism or democracy, is a thinking slow process. But the platforms are designed for a thinking fast process. It's insidiously manipulative of our emotions. We really need researchers, platforms, experts, and, and I would also underline media, because online disinformation, manipulation, in, incitement is really a societal problem. We need really to rebuild trust. And for that, we need to rebuild the media ecosystem and the social media ecosystem. I'd say that progress and actionable insights are possible, but we need to develop the bonds and the modes of cooperation that allow us to push those actions further. Despite decades of activism, of Security Council resolutions, of political footwork, and also hard lessons from the field of conflict resolution and peace building, women around the world are still excluded from the peace processes that affect them. 
we firmly believe we've got all the normative documents that we need. We have resolutions, we have statements. Uh, what we need is implementation. I think we have to make sure that we walk the talk. One of the most important things we're doing was supporting uh, the development of national action plans. Our women in most of West Africa have been relegated when before traditionally they were the key um, peace builders in the communities. I think we would also want to go back to that. Women should be part of all delegations to peace talks as well as the implementation of peace agreements. A gender perspective needs to be integrated into the agenda of all the negotiation. Peace building financing is of course the crucial nuts and bolts of peace building. COVID-19 has driven new demands, however, for peace building financing. This is happening on two main axes, escalating humanitarian needs in countries already struggling to emerge from conflict and new prevention challenges in countries that now face risks of fiscal crisis with consequent social unrest and political instability. The real challenge on peace building finance isn't just one of mutual accountability between those who may want to invest, those who have ideas for the future of their countries and civil society, but it's there's this broader systemic challenge that we face around securing agreement on what could a global financial model for sustainable funding for peace building look like. It's not just a matter of finding enough financing, but it's finding the right mix of financing. Peace building is, is crucial for an inclusive recovery. So as we know, mobilize for an inclusive recovery, let's make sure that that is a mobilization for peace building. Famine is back on the agenda. And of course, as always, the famine issue is closely connected to violent conflict. $5.5 billion is urgently needed to stave off famine in multiple countries. That's not the total financial picture. That's just for the 34 million people out of the 270 million that are marching towards starvation that are already knocking on famine's door. Increasing famine is not something that is not solvable. It is a solvable challenge. The question is, are we up to it? We live in a world in which those most powerful countries find it easier to deliver guns to war zones than they do food. And this is systemic failure. Really bringing together those partnerships to ensure simultaneous investments in system support, both food and social protection systems, reaching those furthest behind. We need to get better at developing cooperative international solutions to the local regional conflict problems and then on the other side of that we have to get better at addressing the problem of, of climate change and with that progress moving forward then we will be building uh, greater food security and the risk of famine will be much reduced. We should try to start to invest in the trust um, a bit more because I think that's also um, blocking these kind of projects uh, by the international community. Uh, there, uh, there isn't enough trust. The double burden of climate change and conflict increases the hardship in extremely vulnerable populations. And this is a humanitarian issue. It is also an issue for thinking about security and it is an issue for thinking about peace building and peacekeeping. We need to move the discourse from theory to practice and actually invest in some of the creative and innovative solutions that local actors are already putting forth. So investing in developing countries, investing in local solutions is where we will actually see potential for real impact. We have a momentum now that we need to seize. There's a greater understanding of the security risks of climate change. There is a renewed American global leadership on climate change that I think we should seize as well. Sometimes dealing with climate issues can also be a way or an entry point into solving, for instance, a conflict between warring parties. To anticipate an act, to work in a more preventable way, the better it is for people, for the planet, but also for the financial resources that are much, much... ...needed in so many other parts. All development, all peace building, has got to be climate sensitive, or else it is not development and it is not peace building. You just cannot divorce it anymore. This pandemic has been a massive shock, no doubt. Uh, and hopefully it can be the start of something new now and an opportunity uh, to move forward and actually start doing. Uh, start doing what we have been talking about for a long time, 
and what is really needed to face our, our common global challenges. In a place where you can have vaccines and all the tools, you may not be able to control COVID if the community is not engaged, if there is trust deficit from the communities. We are all equal leaders and we should be having an equal um, power dynamic between us. And that will only happen when we even start calling ourselves co-leaders instead of a partner. We need a networked approach if we want to build multilateralism 2.0. We need metrics for impact. Fundamentally, we need to be seeing what works. These crises are interconnected and have long-term impacts. Therefore, what we need to do is an overall approach looking how we can support a recovery that can be resilient as well as inclusive. We cannot be afraid of change or failure. We need to embrace the reality of continual mutual learning as a part of building peace. Therefore, you have to have partnership and therefore also you have to have leadership because partnership is about everybody stepping up and it's about leadership enabling everybody to step up. I think that film kind of lays out the problems and the challenges, and we have a panel to begin to look at that and uh, a small enough group that we can have discussions about it. I'll start with the panel. Right next to me is uh, Tom Madioc, uh, Executive Director of the Joint Civil-Military Interaction Network, Senior Lecturer in Conflict Analysis and Resolution at Middle Georgia State, who's gonna talk about conflict transformation. Next to him is Colonel Jay Liddick, Director of the Peacekeeping Stability Operations Institute, a civil affairs officer with deep experience in various countries working with local peoples and his command and staff experience at every level. And he will talk about his on the ground experience in trying to deal with these issues with the local folks. Next to him is Dr. Ivan Ilunga, Associate Professor of Political Science, International Relations at Save Virginia University in Rhode Island. Um, he has worked intensively in the international organizations, think tanks, NGOs, business, microfinancing, uh, investment in fragile states and conflict region. Uh, he's going to talk about what it looks like at the bottom in order to get to the better peace. And finally, least but not last, um, Lisa Charlin from Australia, Senior Fellow and Director of the Protecting Civilians in Conflict Program at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C., previously a Deputy Director of Defense Strategy and National Security, Head of the International Program of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Canberra, uh, served as the Defense Policy Advisor to the Permanent Mission of Australia to the United Nations, um, and uh, has dealt with multinational negotiations and response and is currently focusing on protection of civilians. So without much more ado, I'm going to ask Tom to start out the discussions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, I'd also like to uh, thank all the members of the, uh, War, Peace and Justice for putting on uh, this evening's event uh, along with all the other um, events that are uh, speaking to an incredibly um, important and meaningful uh, subject, what we mean by war, peace, and justice, and how we as a people will, will redefine it in the, in the years to come. Um, video certainly does uh, demonstrate um, what needs to be done, um, and does it uh, very, very clearly and very, very succinctly. Uh, what I would like to speak uh, about in, in my time this evening is, uh, okay, so what do we do about it? Um, I don't ever think there's a, there's a shortage of, of, there's an inadequacy in identifying the problems. I think we stumble on what to do about it. And uh, I would like this evening to at least uh, suggest that in conflict work, in peace work, the place we should start is with our own um, self-work. And in my time, I'd like to speak very specifically to uh, sharing my ideas on how 
we as conflict practitioners, peace practitioners, should view and interact with conflict and how we, we should see it in a, in a I, I will at least suggest, in a, in a much different way than maybe um, many people have become accustomed to. The other uh, benefit I have this evening is to go first, so I get to set the, <laughs> get to set the, the, the tone for my colleagues, who I'd much, much rather listen to than myself, and I'm sure you will as well when we get done. You'll say, gee, boy, they were really good. I don't know why they made that match out guy. But my, uh, my background is in, uh, is in conflict analysis and resolution, and so it may be a, a little bit odd when I propose that uh, policy and strategic levels of analysis and practice uh, have left, us, have left us wanting. Conflict resolution has routinely failed to end violent conflicts, leaving us dissatisfied and with results that have failed to meet our expectations. Violent conflicts may, ta may <clears throat> take a temporary pause, but they remain unresolved. In the time I have, I'd like to introduce different ways of thinking about conflict that can um, lead to their transformation, vice resolution. A uh, key to a conflict transformation mindset is recognition that conflicts do not end. They transform themselves into new manifestations. And they have their own logic and make perfect sense to the people in conflict. We currently have entered an age of persistent multi-generational conflict in what has been characterized as a war amongst the people, where the fight has moved from the battlefield to the human domain. Irrespective of post-Cold War geopolitical shifts and the end of industrial war, to further quote General Rupert Smith, the focus of diplomatic and military efforts have remained on conflict resolution. It sounds good, but it rarely delivers. Simply, the intractable conflicts we currently face push back against any resolution. Greed and grievance thinking has been the main focus of conflict resolution theorists and practitioners for a good long while. Only today's violent conflicts are primarily ethno-political and ethno-territorial. It is about identity, not competition for resources and power though they still remain part of the calculus, but only a piece of the puzzle. Today's unstable geopolitical environment presents us with an incredible array of wicked, wicked and stubborn conflicts. Conflict resolution offers us the tyranny of an answer. I suggest existing conflict resolution strategies have let us down not simply because the models are faulty, but rather many of our approaches to conflict are inappropriate. We see conflict as something that can be worked on, fixed, and moved along, something out there. It is a very Western approach that removes the analyst and peace practitioner from the conflict. Conflicts can be known from the outside, but they can only be understood from the inside. To peacefully transform conflict, we are obliged to step inside and allow the conflict to be our teacher. Wicked problems are incomplete, contradictory, constantly changing, and they actively resist solutions. The most wicked problem of all may be defining a wicked problem. An attempt to solve any aspect of a wicked problem simply results in the creation of a new set of problems. Conflicts are living organic systems and subsystems which possess their own logic. Unfortunately, many view conflicts as something that can be named, bounded, and resolved. I propose that the world of wicked problems has no solution. I recommend we exchange conflict resolution with conflict transformation, possibly even conflict management, but that is for another time. Conflict transformation is not about resolving conflict. The focus, rather, is making conflicts better problems. Conflict is a creative resource. It is something to be shaped in a way similar to shaping the battlefield. In working to shape conflict, it is vital to appreciate the specific conflict's logic so that we can use its energy to redefine it and to understand it differently. Current conflict resolution thinking can be seen in, in a Seurat painting. And I ask you to think of, of the famous Seurat pointillism um, uh, picnic in the park. It is made up of numerous brush points that can be 
give the impression of a unified whole. However, when viewed up close, we see it as many independent brush points. As a metaphor for conflict, we see each independent point as a piece of a conflict, economic, political, cultural, religious, for instance. Many believe if we can fix each piece, collectively we fix the conflict. Conflict has made simplistic and irrational problem to be solved. This is the checklist approach to conflict resolution, one that does not respect the fluidity and logic of conflict. Now I ask you to think of, of conflict tra transformation and how it, is, it, it perceives conflict. I ask you to think of, of, of not of independent brushstrokes, but of Monet's water lilies. In this painting, we see the expressionist painter strokes and how they flow into each other. The painting cannot be disaggregated as Seurat's pointillism can. This painting recognizes how conflict is entwined and it flows together seamlessly. The painting communicates conflict as a single living organism. Conflict transformation is about working on the whole, not separating the pieces. It's about seeing the connections and patterns. Conflict like the painting can only be understood in its entirety. Uh, I've written on this uh, in the past, and it's, uh, but in, in the interest of time, we, we need to find conflict in transformation. We need to seek out the conflict gestalt, the conflict that is more than the sum of its parts. Van Gogh's Starry, Starry Night provides this visual of, of, of conflict gestalt, where we, we know, where we come to know the whole. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, in talking with my colleagues over dinner, I, it made me think I, I need to go off script a little bit here for a minute and, and, and introduce this idea of, of a, a, when we see a gestalt, when we see, see conflict and we see it as a whole, we could apply a medical model to it. Just this idea again, so what do we do about it? Well, when we come up to conflict, whether it's at the political policy level, strategic, operational, or tactical level, we need to apply the medical model to it, or we can. Diagnosis, prognosis, therapy. We need to recognize that, that, this, that, that the conflict is a pathology that needs to be dealt with and focused on in a very holistic way. And I can talk more about that uh, uh, later if, if anyone is interested. But conflict models of peace building currently are like, are like building a wall. It's, it's, it's putting bricks together that, that are, are independent and then, and then they, just, they just form a wall. And what I'm suggesting is we have to move away from that and, and think of conflict in a more artistic, expressionist way, one where we are involved in creating um, a, a, a new reality. Those um, engaged in conflict transformation accept a conflict system's driven character that results in interdependent patterns and groups. Conflict transformation shares conflict management with others, local actors, NGOs, IOs, host nation, partners, and so on, by way of mutually shaped collective intent. Intent-driven action on the part of all parties is more important than endless planning. Field Marshal Moltke's point always was that intent is more important than planning. And this from the framer of the German general staff. Conflict transformation efforts engage, align, and adjust resources as a conflict shape shifts. Rather than build a wall made up of independent bricks, conflict transformation works with the living stones to create something new, an ongoing better problem. Conflict transformation is simply civil and military stakeholders working collaboratively as artists who approach conflict as their medium to transform. Uh, at this point, I, I would like to pass, pass the baton on to my colleague, uh, and um, I look forward to your, your questions and critique and criticism uh, after the break. So thank you. All right, hey, thank you, Tom. Uh, so I'll be coming at it from a little different perspective. Uh, again, these are my thoughts. It's not the position of the Department of Defense of the United States Army, but somebody who's been a, you know, this is a soldier's perspective and a practitioner's perspective and as a civil affairs officer you know our job on behalf of the military is to engage with to try to understand and influence the civil population so we achieve military objectives um, but frankly my, my first experience in this this realm was before I became a civil affairs officer and I was an engineer and that was in Bosnia and it was a really profound experience for me because it was a the first time I had really been somewhere in the midst of a, a place that had gone through something very traumatic uh, 
and I, I was consumed by reading about it and understanding, uh, understanding it as best I could. And, and to see and interact with folks, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day and at the core essence of this, conflict transformation is a human endeavor. I mean, it's about people. Life, death, fears, hopes, dreams, living, uh, you know, lives and well-being. And as, as Tom alluded to, from, from my experience, and that extends into Iraq, Colombia, Afghanistan, um, it is not easy. Every situation is absolutely different. In, in digging into the historical background, you know, uh, if you look at Bosnia situation, I mean, we're not talking generations, we're talking centuries where grievances go back and forth. Uh, the, the different cultural aspects of each location, the religious aspects within that environment, race, gender, the economic conditions that, that may have led to or predicated or leaves people in, a, in uh, the situation they're in. I think that the, the confounding part of it all is there's no one size fits all answer. Every, every place is unique. Uh, the situations are, are different and we're dealing with human lives. Um, you know, it, is, it has been my personal experience uh, from a U.S. military mindset that, and I, I, it, it's one of the reasons why I'm still sitting here today as a member of the military, is that by and large, I mean, the military folks, when they're in locations like this, they want to be, have a positive impact. They care about the people they're, they're working with, and by our, the very nature, they want to solve problems. As Tom alluded to, these are wicked problems, but there's, there's a goodness there, and there's a focus on how do we make it better? How do we, how do we proceed without doing harm? And, and I believe that to my core, I wouldn't be still in the military, that that's our, that's our modus operandi and our, our overarching drive in every one of these pieces. But as I said, every, every situation is unique, and these are multifaceted problems. And, you know, again, confounding part of a wicked problem is how you still have to come up with some kind of frame that allows you to start to understand it. And, you know, kind of that paradigm that we use is, is looking at different sectors, security, and obviously that's a primary piece for the United States military in these environments uh, because security, it's, it's first and foundational in a lot of respects. You can't, it's hard to build or sustain peace when folks are still fearing for their lives and are in the midst of a fight. Uh, then you look at governance and participation. How do you draw people in to get a governance solution that is truly looking out for the welfare and sets conditions for that entire uh, citizenship. Uh, justice and reconciliation. How do, you, how do you get systems in place and what mechanisms exist to deal with grievances and address past crimes and allow people to get to a position where they can move forward? Uh, humanitarian assistance and social well-being. Uh, one of the, the military, U.S. military's primary roles in situations like that is to meet immediate needs of population. I mean, in, in, in a lot of these situations, uh, you know, literally people could be, have the potential of starving to death or, or, uh, or dying in a, a bad way if, if those immediate needs, so almost that Ma Maslow's hierarchy of getting, uh, getting things situated to, to a point where you can move forward economic stabilization and infrastructure. How do you, how does it move forward to the point where people have economic opportunity where they can earn money and take care of themselves, take care of their families and, and live lives, live their lives. Um, so those are the, the, the sectors, the frames that, that we use to start to try to grapple with this and get our heads around it. But, you know, when you start talking about words like reconciliation, reintegration, grievances, those are tough, tough problems. And the, the military alone is never going to be the, the sole solution to 
transforming uh, conflict situation into sustainable peace. Key, key part of it, but never the sole solution. And the, the fact is, and this has been true in every one of my experiences, it requires hand-in-hand -hand work with a team of teams. And that's right there first and foremost with the, 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 the people who are living it and in the situation and it is their home. Uh, and working that from a, a very local perspective to a district perspective to a state or national perspective. And then we're, we have coalition partners there, so are other military people, other military forces. How do you bring them in? And then from a U.S. government perspective, Department of State and the USA or Agency for International Development, um, actually Department of State has the lead for stabilization for our government. So how do you bring them in and build that transition to them for a lot of the responsibilities and then continue that work uh, while we're ensuring security, but allowing it to move forward with uh, the stabilization efforts that go back across those sectors, because the sectors I reference are also, uh, they parallel to how the, the Department of State in the United States views stabilization as well. But intergovernmental organizations, I mean, tying into the UN and other entities that provide tremendous resources, expertise, and sustainability to challenge or to uh, addressing a conflict uh, transformation situation. And then non-governmental organizations. There are literally hundreds working in any one country that, that have unique expertise, unique ability to be places, and help contribute to the solution. But as, as you said, that, that's a, it's a tough thing. How do you paint that, that art uh, and turn it into artistry? Because the, the hardest part is getting a, a shared understanding of the problem. It's a hard problem to understand to the beginning, and then how do you share that across partners uh, to understand what's happening, what's not happening, and what can be done about it? Uh, and it really takes obtaining and trying to maintain an in-depth, nuanced understanding of the situation. And it's hard. Cultural barriers, language barriers, organizational differences. Uh, but it never can move forward if, if, if we're not trying the integration. You, you know, to, to quote someone, uh, sometimes you, you, know, you don't know what you don't know, but you, you do the, the best you can to understand it as deeply as you can and, and proceed. And at the end of the day, our, our objective is to have a governance solution there that protects and enables a, a secure, stable, and good environment for the, the citizens there. But it's also my experiences that, you know, outsiders can, ex, uh, can assist and support a, a transformation from conflict to a peaceful environment, but it only works and lasts when, when the core of it is done and achieved internally to that location. So those are just some of my observations from the, the years. Uh, Obviously something I feel passionately about. It's hard work, but it's good work. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my, my friend here. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, hearing my colleagues and co-panelists here, uh, I feel like we are dealing with a very difficult topic. And and I'll start by saying I was born under a dictatorship. And I saw the change from dictatorship to the hope of democracy with the idea of saying democracy will bring peace, will bring stability, and will bring transformation. Nearly 27 years now, it looks like we could easily manage and understand uh, the predictability of uh, a dictatorship. And yet we cannot understand and uh, see anything 
in terms of where democracy or democratic system is leading the country. And I'm talking about the country known as Zaire at that time and the Democratic Republic of Congo now. With that being said, uh, observed the change. I saw peace being imported, at least the idea of peace and stability coming from outsiders. And the biggest question is, whose peace are we looking or trying to build? And yes, I'm talking about the conflict transformation from local perspective. And the same question will go to who is local? And when do we start by being local? Or what is the meaning of local in order for us to understand and build that narrative of conflict transformation from local perspective or by the locals. Three key points, I guess, uh, made me think as I was listening on the idea of local is, are we referring to local as victims of instability of conflict? Or are we referring to local as people resident of a place that has been destabilized, uh, fragile, and in uh, violence? Or are we referring to local as people who are supposed to have agencies in deciding what to do with their destiny and or what type of model of peace and stability need to be promoted from the grassroots? So, of course, I'm not bringing answers <laughs> because these are some very difficult questions and we have not yet been able to grasp them, even when we talk about peace and stability and security and local uh, dynamic. Yeah, probably three key points that I wanted to reflect on as we look into this idea of transforming uh, the conflict transformation from local perspective. One is the idea of understanding maybe the nature of uh, instability. And two will be just to look on the current practices that we have seen and we are defending and promoting, and maybe to hand with a proposed uh, solution or at least an idea. In many of uh, these places that we call local communities, uh, conflict or instability and violence are multi-dimensional and multi-layers. Uh, on one side might be conflict because people are upset and then they don't want a leader A and B to be in charge. And in the set, same countries, in an other local community, the frustration might be of not having basic services such as water, <clears throat> access to education and so on. And these are realities happening in the same country, sometimes same regions, just mile down the road. These ones are complaining because they are not represented in the political system or institutions. And on the other side, people are complaining because they are represented, but they don't have enough of resources through their representation. So we see right there that it's not only about uh, institutions, it's not only about inst uh, representations, but we may have one conflict with multiple uh, layers. And how do we go about? The same reality is that uh, some of these conflicts are seasonal. They are not permanent. And here I have to say most of the strategic responses that are being projected and promoted are not seasonal. Sometimes are permanent. You have a plan of stabilization for five years. Great, so we have to put resources and then stabilize this country and this local community with one set of plan for five years. But the country has a seasonal conflict. Maybe that tense and the conflict 
uh, will last probably for two weeks and then uh, everyone go back to their farms and then come back fight next year. So how do we then analyze that and address that type of things? That is the first nature of conflict. The second, at the local level, it's uh, that the conflict is uh, multidirectional. Uh, first, it may come from a system to individuals. So the system is not providing and then people got frustrated and we have Arab Spring, for instance. Uh, the direction comes from institutions to local individuals and people got upset. But on the other side, you have the same, uh, the reverse direction, where conflict is from individuals to system. And here we think of uh, ethnic conflict, as Tom mentioned. A local community feels like they are excluded, they are victim of uh, exclusions based on uh, identity or race, ethnic, and then they stand against the system. So at that point, fixing the local situation will not be fixing the system, to be mm -hmm. creating representation within the system. But on the other side, if the system is not effective, fixing conflict will mean addressing the systemic issue. These are two elements in the nature of local conflict that we keep observing. So how about the practice? So what is the current practice in addressing this thing? Uh, I think the current practice of peace and conflict resolution, it's more that of importing or importation, as I want to call it, of foreign peace to what seems to be local instability. We assume that if we establish democracy, everything will just work. And I have to say, I defend the right cause of democracy. But good governance does not always mean democracy. So that idea of uh, exporting on one side peace or importing from a local perspective speaks to what we are looking and seeing today, what are called the unfitness of responses and strategies. It's not that we don't have resources. It's not that people don't want to see change. It's that the situation or solutions that we are suggesting is not fitting in their context. Just let's think a little bit, and I'll be brief on that, let's think a little bit uh, about, for instance, COVID responses. Some places people will say, well, people don't want to get vaccines. Just one of examples, right? But probably the idea is not that people don't want to get. It's that local community don't understand what you mean by vaccination. So if we don't, uh, speak the language of the local, we may think that solutions are, or locals are rejecting. No, they are not rejecting. It's just that we are pro providing or suggesting uh, unfit responses or strategies. And moving to proposed solution, and that's where I will try to hand for this session, or this part, I think we need to get comfortable in stepping out of outside the box. And it's not always easy to say, let's innovate. Let's acknowledge that this solution is not fitted for this particular community. So we need to embrace some policy innovation with the local and by the local. We, as outsiders, in some instances, we just have to support and then say, well, by the way, as I said, uh, uh, I was born under dictatorship. I was not speaking French. I was speaking French and Swahili, not English. So if someone says, for instance, the term gun, right? Uh, gun in French, it's gloves, right? But when you get the sound of gun in English, you may think I'm talking about the weapon. So that idea of embracing certain uh, language in innovation, it's critical. And this, we need to be comfortable, stepping outside our comfort spaces and so on. And another solution is just the idea, it's a call to action. We need to appreciate our local intelligentsia, local indigenous communities, our knowledge. 
We need to value them. It's not because most of them are not written into academic languages and widely spread around the world that they don't make sense and they are not effective. So that is an element of local uh, a transformation of conflict from local perspective. And probably the last point is that of being comfortable supporting these local initiatives, even when they seem to be against our perspective and understanding of peace and stability. And it's only then that we may somehow start creating a synergy of building peace from local and with the local. Although we don't still know what local would mean every time. So I'll stop there and pass the button to Liz. Thank you, Ivan. Um, it's a hard act to follow the panelists that have gone before me, um, but I will do my best at, at this point to reflect on a, a few different points um, before we go into the discussion. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to take part in this dialogue today, which I think is so important. Uh, when we consider that around the globe at the moment there are more than 90 million civilians that are displaced, largely by conflict, um, there is a significant challenge there that needs to be addressed. And I think when we also consider that the nature of conflict itself and who is impacted by it uh, is evolving rapidly, as we saw by the video that was put before us, um, there is no shortage of a need for a range of different solutions and contributions from, from individuals. And I think Ivan's points there about um, the importance of locally-led solutions is one that I think increasingly we um, will be continuing to look at how we, you know, for, for those of us who work in this sort of practitioner or researcher space, which often sometimes I feel like we're imposters in this, in this debate, um, you know, need to be driven by what, what we're hearing from those that are affected by conflict. My points today are really coming from the perspective of someone who has been researching some of these issues, but also been in a position in government trying to demonstrate why government should care about conflicts that are happening halfway across the, ro the world, for instance. Um, if it's not within the geographical landscape that might meet a country's strategic interests, um, if it isn't an issue where there might be shared values that we're trying to, to uphold or guide, um, and, you know, on the point of humanitarian needs, which often I find sometimes, unfortunately, is the least compelling argument when it comes to why a country should care about conflict. Um, these are all the factors, I think, that, that come into play when having conversations with different stakeholders about, as outsiders in some of these contexts, why it should matter to, to get engaged and, and to be involved in supporting some of these efforts um, to engage in resolving conflict or transforming conflict. And we know from past and from history that a lot of mistakes have been made and I think it's an ongoing learning process and one where for a lot of us who are outsiders in some of these processes have to remain very humble in the way that we go about it. So there's three topics I broadly wanted to, I guess, touch upon in, in my remarks today. Um, the first related to really, and I think this touches on some of the points that you mentioned, Ivan, around who has a role and voice in the transformation of conflict and who leads. And I think these are really important questions when we consider the different international and regional interventions that we've seen into conflicts. Um, in the program I work at, um, the Protecting Civilians in Conflict program, at the Stimson Centre, for instance, um, you know, one of the things we are often considering in terms of the work we do is how we make sure that those perspectives are being integrated into the work that we're doing and that there isn't a top-down approach um, or one that's you know, focused on just applying perhaps templates that have been used in the past. We see this in contexts such as the UN, I think, where we, we see increasingly there is an effort to make sure that civil society, for instance, has a seat at the horseshoe table when some of these conversations are taking place. Don't get me wrong, there is a very long way to go when it comes to including more broadly those affected by conflict in those conversations, but we do see to these debates starting to shift. I think similarly um, in the context of peacekeeping operations, which is an area um, where you know, our organisation has been involved in some work, there is a heightened awareness of the importance of engaging and working with local communities in these conversations. But there isn't also an inherent challenge here and a tension that, that sort of needs to be looked at. And I think when you look at issues such as uh, human rights, for instance, this is where we see some of the tensions play out around some of those different models that can be applied in conflict. So one scenario, for instance, when we look at the deployment of a peacekeeping operation, 
is that there is this principle that they deploy with the consent of the host authorities in the country where they are deploying. Um, and that they work and cooperate with them in you know, looking at ways to resolve the conflict and bring about peace. But what do you do in scenarios where those that you're meant to be working with are committing human rights abuses against civilians? And I think this is an inherent tension as we sort of explore some of these issues around um, how we attempt to resolve or transform or address conflict in these scenarios, and certainly goes to the themes of war, peace and justice. Um, similarly, I think one of the important issues here when we look at the, the role of international and regional and outside intervention uh, often comes back to um, this concept of protection of civilians, which is something that I think has really been ingrained in the way that militaries or police or, or the civil military cooperation that we see um, in a lot of these conflicts these days. Um, but also ensuring that those interventions aren't replacing what is already there in place on the ground when it comes to locally led conflict resolution, uh, when it comes to unarmed protection movements. Um, don't get me wrong, there is a role when it comes to making sure that force is available and ready to be used to intervene when civilians are under um, threat from imminent physical violence, when they're at risk of mass atrocities. Um, but it's determining how we use these different tools effectively that I think could have a really transforma transformative um, impact um, in terms of conflict. I think another important point in relation to uh, looking at the role of some of these outside interventions uh, relates to these transition and exit processes. And this is something that we see as an ongoing discussion. We've seen in the context of the UN, for instance, missions have been deployed for to, some have been deployed for six decades, um, but some of the bigger multidimensional ones there have been for, for two decades. What does a transition and exit look like in that context? How has the international presence disrupted the local, um, the local landscape, uh, the local ecosystem? Um, these are questions that we see around political economy and the disruption that also takes place to the, the local economy and the population as well. So there's a lot of really important questions there. The second point I wanted to, to briefly touch upon is this question of who gets to define security uh, when we're looking at the context of conflict. Um, and we've had some discussion here around um, sort of what that looks like for different individuals affected by conflict. But the point I wanted to raise in this context and one that was identified in the video that we've just had in particular, I think, is the way that we define conflict. Traditionally, when we've looked at casualties or those who have been affected, um, it might be sort of um, battlefield casualties, uh, those that have been injured, killed. Um, and I think there is a broader discussion um, that many are engaged in these days looking at, well, what are the longer term consequences of this conflict and what does that mean for the way that we engage in conflict transformation? What does it mean for a veteran who's been deployed who might have moral injury from the things that they've witnessed or been involved in um, that might have devastating consequences for them when they come home? What does it mean, uh, for instance, when we talk about the way that security is perceived? Now, if we look at the example of COVID that was mentioned there, now I'm not saying that was a conflict scenario, but we had people locked down in their houses. And for many women, that is the most um, threatening environment that they may be placed in. And so perceptions as they relate to security can be very different for different aspects of the population and, and different constituencies there. And so I think certainly we had mentioned in the video there of the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And I think that, in my viewpoint, has a really the potential there to have quite a transformative uh, impact in the way that we address conflict largely because those seats have not been available for, for women and diverse women to be at the table, um, and not just having the seats available when it comes to conflict resolution, but also ensuring that they're actually in a position to meaningfully contribute to those conversations. Um, and I say that not as the only women up here, because I'm sure that is a view shared by many of the panelists as well. Uh, but I think you know this is something that we are seeing in the way that we look at conflict now, is how do we make sure those voices are heard? How do we make sure those perceptions, uh, different perceptions of security are taken into account? Uh, and how do we make sure that we look at this when it comes to building resilience against future conflicts? Um, and I think gender equality is one of those really key points to that discussion. The final point I wanted to, to touch on in conclusion um, was this concept, I think, really, of this question around how do we build societal resilience uh, to, to future conflicts? Um, you know, and how do we make sure that this is sustainable and we prevent a relapse into conflict? And I think these are really important questions uh, at the moment when we look at the, the nature of conflict going forward. Uh, key questions here, I think, relate to um, what does trust in institutions look like 
we've had some discussion here from fellow panelists about the fact that, you know, um, what is the end goal when you have an intervention into some of these scenarios where you're trying to address some of the facets of conflict? Uh, is it about establishing democratic institutions? Is it about ensuring that the population has trust in the institutions that they're looking to? And I think these are important questions, not just looking in the context of what we traditionally define as a conflict situation, um, but for those of us living in what have been comparatively healthy democracies for some time, and what that means for the future going forward. And so I think these are really important questions here as well. We conducted some research um, that we released back in March at the Stimson Centre, looking at the issue of strengthening human rights, for instance. And one of the findings of that research from engaging with a range of stakeholders who had either been in conflict settings or living in what would be deemed uh, societies relatively free from conflict was this idea that there seems to be an apparent lack of understanding about why we focus on upholding human rights, why these issues are important, why 70 plus years ago did we have the Declaration on Human Rights and all these efforts to make sure it's ingrained into the way that we look at transforming um, the nature of conflict and society on the ground. And so I think there's a really imperative question there and that's why forums and discussions like this are so important in exploring some of some of these questions, um, because I think we take it for granted that these things are, you know, upheld by everyone, and we see that in conflict around the globe, the way that civilians are targeted, the way that uh, war is conducted, uh, the way that atrocities are committed. And so I think these are really important questions when we can consider how do we build that societal resilience to um, future conflict. And I think an important point related to this is the way that we consider what the different drivers of conflict are that we're looking at. You know, we know climate, for instance, is something that is really sort of on the radar these days because of the impact that it is having on displacement, on people's livelihoods, um, disrupting um, perceptions of inequality, uh, driving grievances and so on. Um, and I think we've seen, even if we look at the context of Ukraine, the second and third order effects of conflict when it comes to food insecurity across the globe as well. So all these things are interrelated. You throw in the online domain, which I'm not even going to get started on. I think that's something for the discussion. And I think we have a very different um, sort of, you know, way of looking at what conflict looks like and who the actors are there. Um, so on that note um, of laying out a few of those challenges, I might finish there and hand back to, to Tom um, or to, to Bill. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate your thoughts. Let us take 10 minutes and come on back. Welcome back for the second half. Thank all the panelists for giving us some interesting insights. What I'd now like to do is throw it open to the floor for anything. Leif? Yes. Gardens and food production. 
good comments. Uh, and the question is, how do we, how do we get at the understanding at the root level? Um, we've mentioned it several times here. Uh, I'll throw it open to someone here on the panel who would like to tackle this. How do we get uh, to an understanding of the various drivers and root causes of conflict at a basic level uh, and convince the institutional structures uh, that are going to respond to this uh, and get their attention, so to say. Um, I'll start over there at the far end with Lisa. Thanks, Bill. Um, and sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, Lisa Rosenberg. Lisa, thank you very much for your, uh, I, I guess, first of all, your comments and your insights. Because I, I, I short question, um, but no, I, and I, I think. Sorry, you can't go enough way. <laughs> Um, look, I, look I, I can't agree with you more in terms of the fact that um, there is a question there about how we address, I, I think we understand, maybe not completely, what a lot of the root causes are, that dri and the drivers of conflict are, but actually getting at, well, what, and this comes back to, I think, what um, Tom was saying at the outset, you know, what are some of the solutions to, to sort of dealing with these wicked problems? I, you know, this may be a, this could open a Pandora's box in terms of um, sort of discussion here, but I think if we place the same amount of emphasis, money, resources into conflict prevention um, as we do into preparing for conflict, um, we might have a different way of approaching some of these things. Um, and, you know, the, the, the difficult question, of course, with conflict prevention or, or looking at whether you prevented a conflict is you, you often don't know if you have, um, because it's much harder to measure, as many of you in the room would know. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of preparing for a conflict, well, you can quantify that a little bit more readily in terms of resources and, and assets and political support and various other things. So I, I think the first point there would be sort of the way that we look at our efforts at, at conflict prevention and putting resources into them. Uh, understanding the root causes of conflict is, is really important. Um, I think obviously having the expertise and knowledge and humbleness to know what is happening in particular countries as well and not just to assume that um, what we're seeing in one country mirrors exactly what the root causes may be in another country um, is, is really, really important there. Um, so I think for me that, that would sort of be a key piece of sort of how we approach some of that challenge. But I think the range and drivers of conflict are going to continue to become more diverse in the years ahead. Um, you know, we're looking at the impact of climate now. Uh, we're looking at the way the food insecurity discussions and the consequences from what was happening with grain coming out of Ukraine and Russia, for instance, have had an impact on the way that countries have um, potentially, you know, aligned themselves, well, I don't want to use the word aligned, um, but sort of the way that they have um, expressed or not expressed um, their support for different measures to address the, the conflict that's taking place there. Um, you know, we're going to see the, the online environment um, and the digital technologies that we've had mentioned and the way that they drive conflict, misinformation and disinformation. There's a whole host of things. So I think it's a holistic approach, but I think it gets back to, to how we perceive conflict prevention and investment. Yvonne? Well, uh, thank you, Lisa. I think <laughs> I will go probably to a point that uh, Jay raised at some point earlier, just the humility uh, in human nature. Uh, often when we see conflict like that, we go in with the idea of saying we are going to fix things, not going to learn, understand what's going on. And Probably going back to that uh, directional aspect in solutions, in the academic narratives and policy spaces, we always say we have all these great solutions in New York and DC and Paris that we have to implement in Iraq, in South Sudan and uh, Zimbabwe. <laughs> so we are going out with the idea of saying we know what these people need. We understand their conflict more than do. Uh, and, and it doesn't always work. I think maybe, uh, yes, we have drivers of conflict and uh, this changing nature of conflict. Uh, climate change wasn't a big deal probably 20 years when we see the impact, uh, the security level and political level, even the narrative itself with the UN I was following last week, almost every head of state and government was trying to make sure that in their very big statement they have a line of climate change. Do they really understand everything? No, at least it's, it's a key word. Everyone wants to use it. But the point is that that's humility of saying we 
are not only uh, responsible in fixing things, but it is also our responsibility to understand things. The same amount of resources we put in uh, responses. Just let's think of humanitarian responses. We assume that people need shelter all the time. We assume that they need water. Maybe they don't need that as their first need. They just need understanding and the harmony between two local communities. But when we see two people fighting, two communities, oh, we need to mobilize funds from the UN, and then we, we put the cap on it, five million for six months without being on the ground, assessing the situation. I just probably say, think it's more kind of getting back to that sense of humility and humanity, saying we don't know everything. We are not always right. And let's learn and let's adapt and change. Jay? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, and this is a challenge to all countries. I mean, from a national security perspective, and not just a US one, any, any nation. We have to expand our, our uh, definition and thought of threat. We tend to focus naturally on groups and actions instead of conditions. And that's a totally different frame. And it leads you to root causes of why groups function they, they, the way they do. But you're, you're addressing symptoms when you're addressing groups versus uh, the, the, the source of the, the disease when you're looking at conditions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, yeah, thank you. I, in, in, uh, you know, speaking of root cause analysis, geez, nothing could be, be, be more important than, than looking at um, the, the drivers of conflict. And, and if I can, I want to thank everybody here. Uh, certainly, I had like four pages of notes here. I'm going to try to make sense of some of it. Um, as good as root cause analysis is, and as, as important as it is, there are some there are some uh, traps in there. I think that we need to be sensitive to. Not least of which is the recognition that that the effect always precedes its cause. And so what I what I mean by that is is we have the the, the conflict that, that manifested itself, and then well, what caused it? And we go back with our basket onto the other side of the the line, and we look. At, at those causes, and we pick those ones out that fit our thesis, hypothesis, and then we come back over onto this side of the line and say those are the root causes of that conflict. Probably so, but it doesn't mean the other potential causes that we didn't pick up and put in our basket are any less valid. So they still remain there. And so even though we continue to work on these <laughs> root causes, the others are still in play. Uh, we're just b been blinded to them. And that makes me think of, uh, of the terms that we use. I, I remember uh, as a, a young lieutenant, I was constantly told to use precise terms precisely. And one of the things I've, I've, uh, I've come to the, uh, one point I've come to is that when we talk about conflict, we've already lost the fight. We're done for. If we allow it to become a conflict, we will be living with it, our children will be living with it, and our grandchildren will be living with it, because history never ends. And so once that conflict has, has, has manifested itself, it's there, and it's not gonna ever go away. But a lot of times we talk about disputes that are tame problems. They have technical answers to them. Um, econ economic problems, food problems, water problems, hydration problems. These are technical problems that have answers. They can, now, do we have the political will? That's another question. But it's not that it's a conflict that needs to be resolved. It's a simply a dispute that needs to be dealt with. And we have techniques to do it. Negotiation, mediation, facilitation, joint problem solving, community circles. You go on down the line to resolve these disputes. So it, it, I don't think it's helpful to call them conflicts because we give them a, a life that says uh, it's a conflict, it's difficult, put it in, the, in, the, in that pile over there, don't worry about it. No, 
I say that's wrong. Now, when I did say that we, when we allow the conflict to manifest itself, we've lost the fight, it's, it's because of that. It, the, the con I said it's a living organism. When we've allowed it to, to, to take on that living, its own life, it's going to feed itself, and it's going to go on. The best place to go, and I think to your point, Leif, is go back to what, uh, what uh, uh, General Smith always refers to as confrontation management. That's what we want to be doing. We want to manage these confrontations before they become conflicts. Once they become conflicts, we can identify the root causes of them, write a lot of books, do a lot of panels, discussions. But to what end? The conflict is still out there and, 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 uh, and now has become intractable because it's taken on an identity. People who are in it now have power, a, a, a sense of self, identity. They're not going to give that up. And so I think, I guess if I was you know, preaching the, 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 the conflict transformation gospel, it's, confront, it's confrontation management. That's where we want to work right, right now. And then and, and manage those root causes, potential root causes, to not allow themselves to, to uh, manifest themselves, if that makes any, any sense whatsoever. Thanks, Tom. Other, other thoughts? Yes. Nobody. 
Great. Yes. Follow up. Yeah. yeah. This is my sister. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's good. I'm glad you came along to help him out. Is, is, do you consider this a is this a conflict or is this a peaceful intervention? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom? Yeah, th yeah, thank you for a uh, very, uh, very um, I gotta stop writing. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, I, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit to make sure I, I very, very, which, I th which I think is right. Yes, I, I'm luck, you know, all, all of us know that there's friction in social life, right? You put, put, Two or three people together, and you know you're gonna you're gonna have friction. Okay, it, what what I would say is a confrontation. When I say confrontation management, I think that's when we think about normal human and group interaction. We come in we can come into confrontations. So when I say confrontation management, I think of putting grease in the, where the friction points are. That's, that's the managing of it. We're going to have, the, the confrontations are just going to be there, and so, uh, so be it. But now how do we, how do we lessen the friction in, uh, above that so that it doesn't become a conflict? Now, I don't have any answers. That's the beauty of being an academic. Um, uh, but so I can add to the conversation. So when I think of conflict, it is a, a confrontation or a dispute that now has an identity component in it. An individual's power, sense of self, identity in the community, place, status, that's now all part of this conflict. 
When that happens, that's what makes it intractable now, a, a conflict. There was that confrontation where we couldn't manage the frictions. And so now these, these, these other conditions have, have, have shown up that are now incredibly difficult to undo. I was using it to break the example of the Palestinians. The, the, the water under the West Bank and, and how it's controlled and who has it, that is a confrontation that needs to be managed. But how, how do you get a, a, a Palestinian who now has status in the community, power, wealth, how do you get them to give that up? See, because now that's what makes it so, so darn difficult. The, the third part of that continuum, which I think many people think is conflict, is the third thing is combat. So when you mentioned the point about, you know, killing an elect, for me, it's, it's as you mentioned, a pro, it, it's confrontation, conflict, combat. And so we, we need to stop thinking, I, I believe, I would recommend, about conflict as if it's combat. That's a whole other dimension. Um, if, if I'm, I know I'm bouncing around a little bit on that, but I, I, I just, well, I, I, I appreciate your comments, and I, I think they're right on the money. Um, it's, I think the missing component is we have to recognize combat as the end of that continuum. And, and if we can keep it left of boom, as they say, then we're, we're much better off. Other comments here? Yeah, I'll just throw out there, you know, when, when I was giving my, my piece of this, and then from a military perspective, talking conflict of it actually being armed, violent, it, we have turned to a violent, a situation of violence, armed actors, et cetera. And interestingly, the Army's current frame right now is looking at things in terms of competition, crisis, and then conflict. The joint force for the last five years has been grappling with acknowledging there's a period, you know, cooperation and competition going on simultaneously all the time at points that transitions into conflict and then you're constantly trying to return to, uh, return to cooperation or, or competition. So, I mean, I, th I think that's an evolution in thought for the U.S. military, but I mean, for us specifically, and it is interesting across the panel like this, or even talking with interagency partners that we work with, definitions of conflict vary, and that, that is problematic. But from a, as a military practitioner, when we talk conflict, I'm thinking violence and force-on-force -force fighting in some capacity. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think my understanding of conflict in this context, it's uh, that permanent uh, ongoing tension, often leading to violence without compromise. It hands the stage of being conflict when we get to an agreement. But as long as it continues to be a permanent tension, We've continued diverse views and approach to one thing which is supposed to be called solution. It remains a conflict. And, and I've probably to add one thing which was not often highlighted in my point, it's a uh, violent conflict uh, as a key word there. And in the cases that I used, the dimension of violent conflict refers to the use of different means to get to a certain result. So I, would, I definitely agree that it's a very difficult thing to define, and depends, you say, depend on language. If I may give just a quick example, 30 seconds. When I was learning English, they told us that uh, love is for people, like is for things. That was the British definitions of when you say, I like this, you can only say it, I like a chair. You cannot say, I like this person, because that is for things. And then I moved to America, when you say, I like, <clears throat> so 
you can still say, I like a person. So that becomes the idea, the, the dynamic. So you can still express the same feeling, but the use of the word uh, depend on context. I think that also it's a reality with probably conflict as well. Excellent question in terms of uh, how the discussion is framed. And I think it, it made me pause for a minute and think back to, um, you know, if we're talking about war, peace and justice, to me, really, that threshold when we're looking at conflict was, you know, where civilians are under threat or there's the use of violence, I think, is the, the context, you know, so largely an armed conflict situation. But I do agree that when we are talking about Conflict more broadly, of course, there is a spectrum of what we're looking at. And if, even if we are looking at armed conflict, there is absolutely a spectrum there in terms of all out war versus something that maybe within a community, cross borders, uh, have a huge impact on civilians. But I think some of the things that correlate with that to some extent are, you know, around discussions of breakdown of institutions and what that means for the use of violence and who has the ability to use violence in those settings and, and the prerogative over that. Um, what are the threats to human security? Um, I liked your question um, about affecting behaviours and how that comes into the way that we look at our responses to, you know, is that what we're trying to do when we prevent conflict or prevent war in terms of affecting behaviours? Because I think that's a really important question. You know, so often we are focused on reforming institutions, but how do you look at sort of, um, you know, discussions of culture, um, discussions of what is, is bringing about perhaps the conflict in society? So there's a lot of terminology that we could get into there, but I, I, I think that was a really relevant question because we are coming at it from very different angles. Thanks for the question, because you get at the heart of the War, Peace and Justice project, uh, continuing dialogue. As you know, all institutions and others have their specific vocabularies in which the triggers their money, uh, their responses, and the like. I remember when uh, the Coordinator for Stabilization and Reconstruction was put together in 2009, I was invited to one of their get-togethers in Washington, D.C., where they were going to solve the definitional problems uh, between Department of Defense, uh, between state, between aid, et cetera. And so, first of all, they had the OSD rep, and they said, What's the difference between coordination and synchronization? Could you please tell us that? Because you're using that term. Dead silence in the room. And after the end of the day, everybody adjourned and nothing could be done. Uh, but the whole key was uh, dialogue. If you can, can have a continuous dialogue going on, which I think that this is what the project is that we are launching upon, you eventually begin to creep up on uh, something that may be acceptable to various folks and slowly begin to change uh, the way you can look at the world. And this was just for the United States, not for the Brits, goodness sakes, and heavens knows not for the UN. I mean, I mean, we're talking about, you know, plateaus into the sky when you begin to figure out how to dissect vocabulary at, at those other levels. But that's an excellent an excellent point because, you know, vocabulary will drive donors, will drive action, will drive results. And uh, many times people working in the field will have no idea why one organization is doing this. Uh, and, and it's all because, uh, you know, they define something a little bit differently than you thought it was. Uh, so great discussion.
78,000 plus uh, suicide from our veterans from 2005 at an incredible cost. The, I guess the point I want to make, and, and to address to Jay as well and the other panelists, is the introduction of force. Force can be used to promote peace mm -hmm. or drive it to more violence. And I believe we force did in fact transform the conflict in Afghanistan to perhaps more violence. And so this goes back, I think, to General Smith's thesis on the utility of force. If it's being used not for its intended purpose, or it's the wrong type of force, that force has no utility. And therefore, conflict or confrontation can be transformed. And so going back to the, the underlying thesis of, of, the, of this particular section, which is bottom-up attempting to resolve conflict, we know through many, many decades of, of cancer treatment research, et cetera, that sometimes the treatment is worse than the, the you know, the cure is worse than the, the, the actual disease. We're not killing the patient. But now we've learned that immunotherapy is now being used which is really using the body's own defenses to, to kill the cancer. And I think this is what, I think what we're missing in, in, in conflict transformation is resolving it at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. And this gets back to the confrontation where it starts. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just throw that out there is, you know, again, we, 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 we failed in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I think we really have to take an honest look at ourselves of, of why that happened. Mm -hmm. Before we stumble again, and I think we have stumbled again in the Ukraine. So that. Well, no, th no um, th th thanks for that, uh, that, that question, Scott. And I, I think this really goes to uh, one of the things I've struggled with. Um, I, I teach peace and conflict studies and have for, for a number of years. And it's a, it's a transdisciplinary subject, and it brings in people from all different disciplines. And you know, we, we struggle with that in the classroom, with the terms that, that are in use. Because you know, political scientists see security one way, humanitarians see it another way, military sees it yet another way. So one of the areas I've been looking at, at least exploring, is, is can we have a unified language um, that we could use? So you don't even, wouldn't even need a special kind of learning to, to understand this complex subject we have talking about this evening. And one of the, the ways I was looking at it, I was like, look, you know, we all understand wellness. We all understand the human body, whatever. So if I, I, I said, well, suppose we imagined a peace worker or a conflict worker as a physician, and that the conflict was a social body, right? Just like a physician came to a body. So if, if the body has a, a, an illness, we want a, a physician that understands the illness, but also understands me and is compassionate and, and recognizes my, my family and my background and all those kinds of things to help develop a, a treatment plan that is going to help bring this, now again, either the human being or the social body back to a degree of wellness and to the wellness that's possible just like uh, 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 Yvonne mentioned, the peace that's possible, right? We have to, we, we can't, we have to, we only do what we can do, right? So this is the kind of peace we can reach here. This is the kind of wellness we can get here. And, and so then we allow the pathology to drive the treatment plan. Again, recognizing the logic and, uh, and, and of, the, of the conflict itself. And, and we let that be our teacher. We don't want the physician to come in. You know, if, if, if I got a heart disease and the, the physician, all he knows is about, you know, proctology, that's not going to be helpful. We, so we, we allow the pathology to drive the treatment plan. And um, uh, uh, to, to, to Scott's point, you know, one of the things we recognize is that we also have to approach it realistically, right? I mean, we have a, a cancer, and I don't know anything about this. I'm not, I don't know anything about medical stuff, only enough to say the wrong thing. But if, 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 let's assume somebody had some type of cancer, and the treatment plan was going to be where we're gonna to have to use a laser to kill these cells. But when we do that, we know that we're gonna kill some of the healthy cells around it. But that's a conscious decision that we've made because that's going to apply force or violence but we're going to do it in a very restricted way, knowing that, we're, that, that there's going to be damage here. But we recognize also that's the only way 
we can bring this body back to some degree of, of wellness. And so I think if we, if we could look at, one of the things I, I, I think, you know, we, we know that metaphors explain our thinking, but I also know that metaphors also frame our thinking. And if we could, you know, so in, it's rather than, maybe we shouldn't be talking about what does conflict mean, but maybe we should use it in another metaphor. What, I'm not suggesting the medical one is the only one, but it might be a helpful one when we're bringing a disparate group of people together from various backgrounds, various learnings, very, uh, various degrees of knowledge, then can talk about that subject through a different set of, or different metaphor world, I guess, for lack of a better word. But, ah. Anyone else on the panel have a metaphor they want to throw in? <laughs> I don't have a different metaphor. I think, um, Scott, it was an important question. I, I guess that the question I'd probably pose back in the context of Afghanistan was at the end of the day, was it about resolving conflict? Um, and I think some of this comes back to the way that we frame, um, or I should say the way that perhaps governments frame engagement in some of these situations. Um, so, you know, in terms of setting what the mission objective is or in terms of setting out um, the goals that are trying to be achieved. Uh, you know, I, I think along the lines of some of the work that, you know, I've focused on, we would often see rhetoric around, well, we're there to uphold human rights and we're there to support women and all those sorts of things. And we see that, you know, at the end of the day, that isn't sort of the outcome that we've had from that two year, that that sort of two decade engagement in that context. So I think coming back to a question in, in that scenario and, and whether that applies to other um, sort of uh, conflict settings or armed conflict settings that we're looking at, you know, is, is the intent of the parties that are coming in from the outside to resolve the conflict or are there other um, objectives that are at play? And I think sometimes that's the challenge that we have in, in some of these settings. That's a very simple answer to a very complex question on Afghanistan, of course, but. Okay. Yeah, if, if I could just add to that, uh, you know, in, in the military, we we have an acronym FASD. When you're developing a course of action, is it feasible, acceptable, suitable, distinguishable? And in that first part, you know, it goes to application of force. And, and I think this is the complexity. There's a great book, The American Experience in Afghanistan, that was written by, the author was here this summer, Chris, and I can't pronounce his last name, so I apologize. But uh, truly understanding, you know, it was, it was really, it was hard to have a grasp on, on the reality in Afghanistan and what, what the, the pushback and, and the waves coming back would be a use of force. And I just say that to, you know, that the, the hard part is figuring out, figuring out up front what is feasible. Is, 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 the, is the overall objective that, that an outside force or entity takes in, in getting involved in something, have you thought through what is truly feasible? And what is feasible also depends on the will that you have that you're willing to associate to achieving it. And that's hard stuff, right? And there's political aspects to it, uh, human aspects to it that just makes it very difficult. Can I get a quick alibi? You can alibi anything you want. It, because I, I, one point that did, did come out too, I, because we did, I get back to you know, we, conflict, we, 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 certainly, um, we certainly flattened that cat this evening, but the, um, the other is, um, is peace. Because we, we have to, under, you know, are, what peace are we working for? A negative one or a positive one? And are, are, we, are we willing to accept a negative peace? Because at least, <laughs> you know, Peace. It, it, it's the peace we can get today um, because positive peace is going to take a little longer. And then we talked about violence. And well, which violence? Cultural violence, structural violence, or direct violence? Because they're, di they're different. So uh, when, you, when you start peeling the onion back, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's... I think it's a real challenge because as you know, it's a plastic situation. Uh, today's vision will change tomorrow. We were there 20 Afghanistans rather than one. And so, you know, as it goes forward and mutates and changes, um, how do you keep on top of all of that and see what 
what is what? Are our institutions up for the adventure? Which, of course, is what we'll talk about tomorrow night. Is uh, are our institutions up for that adventure or not? Uh, are they able to grapple with this changing situation? Uh, other questions out there? Well, I, 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 may, I may be in error, but I'll never be in doubt. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the point uh, would you bring up, to, uh, you know, I think we, the old saying, what, ideology is a full stop to thinking. Um, and, and anything that ends in ism, right, is a, is a full stop to thinking because now it's an identity issue. You know, I don't care what it is, ageism, feminism, uh, uh, you know, name the ism, right? If, if that's the answer you got, then identity has now become part of, of the conflict and, and you're not resolving, you're not working on the conflict anymore. You're, you're now have, going to have to give up some of your identity and sense of self and, and so forth and so on. So you're not gonna have your ideological purity, whether it's Republicans, Democrats, or, or, or any, any number of things. And so I think, um, you know, it, it has to be kept, people, and we were talking the other day, one of the problems is people just don't think today. They just, they just take something off the shelf and run with it. That, that you know, I, I, I go get my identity, right? And so that's what make, makes the conflict so problematic is you, you, within a political realm, people aren't, I, I watched something the other day, um, Oh, I was watching about the election. I was talking to Scott this morning over breakfast. I was watching the ele election in Italy about the, the new, new uh, prime minister there. And I didn't hear one person question any policy. I just heard a whole lot of invective. And, and well, how's that helpful? I mean, you, be, you, we, can, we, can, we can dispute a policy. We can deal with a policy. We can argue over a policy. And we can change a policy. But once we, we, we um, throw these, these invectives in there, now we've made them identity issues. And that, boy, that, that's a tough, tough thing. You know, Mike, we're talking about, about the, the use of, of Nazis in, 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 the, in the Ukraine narrative. You know, well, hell, I'm not gonna negotiate with a Nazi. Not, because Nazis are all these things, you know? I mean. Well, I think one of the comments on the film about thinking fast, thinking slow, uh, where we, uh, have a thinking fast internet mm -hmm. uh, and our thinking slow processes have been <coughs> ramped up by the thinking fast cyber world. Yeah. So that's another thing that's of interest. Well, we have, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll be quick. On the case of the US, I think I might be provocative a little bit. First, it's because we only have two political parties. Maybe if we had multiple political parties with influence, I'm not saying we should have 50 or 100, but at least a good number will create more balance. Second, <laughs> I think as a society, we have transferred from the local standpoint, we have transferred our responsibility to political party instead of to institu legitimate institutions. When we think of uh, the social dynamic of social contract in democratic society, no, it has never been that of transferring uh, our voices to a political party, but to 
representatives. So if we speak to the idea of representatives, we're not speaking to the idea of blue or red, mm -hmm. speaking to the idea of who can uphold my values in my settings. And this is not what is happening. And I think maybe it's an element to reconsider mm -hmm. in the dynamic of local politics in the country. Are we supposed to uphold a uh, two-party system at the local level, or we should go with the idea of uh, voting the sheriff who will defend, who understand uh, local safety? Should we vote for a representative who understand the school system? Or should we vote for a representative who understand the language of lobbyists? These are some, I think, difficult conversations. As a society, we need to get to and start unpacking. They are not pleasant, but they are real if we want to tr transition this conversation from establishment to local uh, dynamic in peace, peace building and reconstru reconstruction. Maybe to hand with uh, the question that uh, Scott asked uh, on the use of force. I think I've seen most in many countries why use of force don't work. Mostly because they come as an extension of countries' foreign policies. The, if a country cannot uh, advance its policy through diplomatic means, they will use force as a military uh, component to advance their foreign policies. And it cannot work in establishing peace in the local communities because it has never uh, intended to serve the interest of communities where these forces are being deployed. And what can work? Lisa mentioned uh, this dynamic within the UN of host countries' consent, or state consent. That also means we call for assistance. But Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places, did they call for assistance? If they didn't, it's clear why it did not work. And if we continue probably practicing the same approach, we'll have the same results because these countries are not asking for assistance. But I'm not saying we should not intervene, but we just have to think on at what extent are we supposed to deploy and are we supposed to act. Yeah. Tom's going to have a closing comment here. Okay, wait, I, I just want to bring back because I, I, I keep thinking about the comment I made about the, the, uh, the new uh, Italian premier. And, and my, 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 I guess the point I, I wanted to make is because I, when we talk about violence, um, it, 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 it's, it's very specific. Violence, the, you, for violence to occur, the other has to be dehumanized. And once the other has been dehumanized, then the space for any conflict transformation has been closed shut. So if I can make them, uh, you figure it out, uh, Nazi, fascist, um, hard right, um, anti this, anti that, then we, we've, we, that's, a, that's a bad path to go down <laughs> because now there's no room that we need to, to um, manage the confrontation. We've just created the space for violence now direct violence against the other. Why not? I mean, the Nazi, I'm saddling up and taking them out. I'm, I'm, I don't want them in my neighborhood. Um, and so I think, the, 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 and it came out when Bill made the point about you know, fast thinking, about uh, the internet, about 144 characters on Twitter. Um, it doesn't give us the space we need um, to, um, to deal with these complexities. Well, I thank you very much for this panel for spending the next hour here with us. Uh, please, I give them a hand here. And, uh, we have Thank you. started Thank the you. conversation. And uh, Scott? Again, I'd like to reiterate, our, thank our distinguished panelists for a, a wonderful uh, discussion. 
I'd also like to thank um, our partner, Dickinson College, for, for hosting and, and providing this wonderful facility for this a panel discussion tonight and all our other uh, partners who and our part, uh, participating organizations that are supporting the War, Peace, and Justice uh, project. Uh, you can follow us on www.warpeacejustice.org. And uh, Dr. Matchak mentioned a term, gestalt, and the, the, the term is, is taking a holistic look, uh, in this case, war, peace, and justice. So for the next several months, we're going to dissect uh, and take this uh, a, 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 a deep look, hopefully, at these three uh, terms. And hopefully, we can come up with some solutions for the future and in reimagining war, peace, and justice. Uh, again, we know war has an incredible cost on society. And we look forward to tomorrow's discussion at the Cumberland County Historical Society, another partner for the War, Peace, and Justice Project. And that will also begin at 7 p.m. and run till 9 p.m. Uh, and that's located on Pitt Street. And so, and lastly, and most importantly, I'd like to thank members of the community that participated in tonight. This is about us uh, understanding war, peace, and justice so we can ask the tough questions when we fail, when we succeed, so we can learn uh, but I think it's up to the American citizenry as part of being part of the democratic process to be involved in this and understand uh, what we've done in the last 20 years so we can do the right thing and, and hopefully attain peace with justice in the future. So thank you very much for attending, and thank you again for our panelists.